Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lamentations is probably not a book that you are all that familiar with. Apart from that beautiful section we hear in today's reading, you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end, they are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. You probably don't have any verses in Lamentations that you just say, oh yeah, that's one of my favorite verses. You probably don't even know very many other verses, if any. And these, these verses, 22 and 23, they're absolutely amazing. They're just dripping with hope and assurance and they're reminders of God's care for us. But the problem is, we tend to just rip those right out of Lamentations and use them as if they're just kind of their own thing and we miss the whole context. And when we understand these words in their context, we'll love these words even more. We'll truly grasp just how wonderful these words of faith are and we'll be better able to make those words our own. Lamentation seems to have been written in about 587, 586 B.C. by the prophet Jeremiah. And he writes this during an absolutely horrible time in the history of God's people. If you know 586, 587 B.C., that's the fall of Jerusalem. That's when things just get ugly. We hear about this. We hear about this in 2 Kings chapter 25. Listen to what happens. Listen to the situation in which Jeremiah finds himself as Lamentations is being written. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged till the, the 11th year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people in the land. Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden, and the Chaldeans around, were around the city, and they went in the direction of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon, and they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took him to Babylon. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the enemy of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people were left in the city were desert and the deserters who had fled to the king of Babylon together with the rest of the multitude of, Ze of Neb Neb Nebuzaradan the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. What do we have? We have a siege. What happens with the siege? The, the whole city's surrounded, right? You have a military surrounding the whole city so that no food, no water can go in or out of Jerusalem. Nobody can get in or out of Jerusalem. And they starve the city. They starve all of the inhabitants. It's not just the military people who are suffering here. It's women and children and the elderly. Everyone in Jerusalem 
is starved. And it gets so bad that the king decides he's going to make a run for it with some of his military. And we hear Zedekiah and, and some of the men, they, they breach the walls and they try and take off and run for the hills. And of course, they're captured. And what happens with, with, uh, with the king, with Zedekiah? His family is killed right before his eyes. And then they put his eyes out, right? This is the last thing you're ever going to see, and then we're going to blind you. And then the city is burned. And then the temple is plundered. And then people are carried off into captivity, and all that's left are the very poorest of the poor. Later on in Lamentations, Jeremiah uh, describes a little bit of this. In chapter 4, he says, The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps, right? Those who are, were rich, now they're brought to the very lowest depths. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment and no hands were wrung for her. It's never good when your predicament is compared unfavorably to that of Sodom, right? You know things are bad when you're like, you know, so the things for Sodom, that wasn't so bad. They just died quickly. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral. The beauty of them, their form like sapphire. Now, their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has, been, has shriveled on their bones. It has become dry as wood. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger that wasted away, pierced by lack of the fruits of the field. Oh, those fortunate people who got killed by the sword, right? That's how bad it was. And it's with this horrific scene in mind. Jeremiah looking out over the smoldering ruins of Jerusalem that Jeremiah writes Lamentations, which is why it's called Lamentations, because it's just filled with laments, with with expressing sorrow and mourning and regret. Now, our culture is really awful at this. <laughs> our culture is terrible at lamenting and at mourning. A loved one dies, and we, we kind of allow somebody to say, okay, yeah, you can, you can grieve for a little while, but the you know, you get, a, you get to the funeral, maybe a little past the funeral, and, and, and all of a sudden there's this pressure, right? Just get back to normal. Stop being sad. Stop lamenting. Stop mourning. Start just acting like everything's okay again. And we, we push people towards this. We can mourn, we can lament, but we, we really push people to get back to normal as quickly as possible. But the truth is, when one is mourning the death of a loved one, there is no going back to normal. Death has claimed that loved one. We can mourn, we can lament, but we can't make things normal again. We can't make things the way they were. That has been stolen from us. That's been taken from us. There will always be something missing. Now for Jeremiah and the people of Judah, or at least those who survived the siege, there was no going back to normal either. The city was utterly destroyed. The temple had been pillaged. Those who were living were on the verge of starvation. The king had been captured and blinded, and now they're going to be taken into captivity. Things were bad. They were really, really bad, and there was no denying it. There was no pushing to get back to normal. All that they were left with was to lament and to hope. 
You see, these, this is why these words of, La- of Lamentations chapter 3 are just so powerful. Jeremiah doesn't write them when he's just sitting on the shore of the, of the Jordan River and it's a beautiful summer morning and the, the sun is up, but it's not too hot and there's, there's sheep grazing in the fields and the fish are jumping in the river and everything is nice. And he says, oh, this is really nice. Great is the faithfulness of God. His mercies are new every morning. That's not the context, is it? He's looking at the smoldering city. He's gone through this horrible siege. He seems un, uh, just undescribable suffering. And he says, in the face of all of that, great is your faithfulness. Now, how do these words resonate a little differently in that context. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. In the midst of this terror, Jeremiah has hope. He has hope in the Lord. Now, you might wonder, how can he have such hope? After all that he's seen, after all that he's been through, how can he speak of the steadfast love of the Lord and how his mercies are new every morning? How can he do that in the face of such suffering? It's because Jeremiah understands that all of this suffering is the result of sin, and he knows that in the end, the Lord will deliver his people, and the Lord will deliver them from all of the afflictions brought about by sin. And we see this. We see this in today's gospel reading. We see this kind of hope, and we see the deliverance that begins to take place from Jesus. Jairus goes to Jesus, right? My daughter's sick. Can you help? And Jesus is going to go, and he's going to help. And as they're going along the way, a woman touches Jesus, doesn't even touch him, just touches the edge of his clothing because she has put her hope in him. Jairus put his hope in Jesus. This woman puts her hope in Jesus, and she thinks, if I just get close enough, If I can touch the edge of his clothing, that'll be enough, because this Jesus can help me. And you can just sense the uneasiness from Jairus, right? When Jesus stops, right? We're in a hurry. We got to go help my daughter. And Jesus stops, and he's like, somebody touched me. (laughs) The disciples were like, yeah, there's a big crowd around you. Probably more than one person rubbed up against you. And he's like, no, no, no. And the woman comes forward, and he tells her, your faith has made you well, right? Go in peace. She had put her hope in him. He helps her. Now, they get to uh, the, where the, the Jairus' house, and the, the people come out to Jairus, and they say, stop bothering Jesus. Your daughter is dead. There's no hope, right? There's no hope. He can't help you anymore. And what does Jesus say? Do not fear, only believe. And he raises the girl from death to life. Jeremiah had hope because he knows the mercies of God. He knows the steadfast love of the Lord. He knew that even as God's people had been severely disciplined by their, because of their idolatry and their sinfulness, that the Lord's steadfast love was true. There was hope in the Lord. It was help that was going to come from the Lord. It was hope that he had for help from the Lord. This is why for us as Christians, at a funeral, we can lament. We can mourn. We can absolutely grieve. We can cry. That's absolutely appropriate because death is a thief and it's taken that loved one from us. But 1 Thessalonians tells us, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Because we do have hope. We have hope in the one who can raise the dead. 
We have hope in the one who has paid for sin. We have hope in the one who has overcome sin. That's why for us as Christians, when we gather for a funeral, we weep, we lament, and then what do we do? We sing Easter hymns. We sing hymns about the resurrection of Jesus because we know that our hope is sure and certain and resurrection life awaits. This is also why for us as Christians, we can mourn and lament the brokenness of the world. You know, you, you look around the world today and you see all of the troubles. You watch the news and it's all bad news. We see drug abuse and broken families and divorces and sexual sin and all of the other kinds of brokenness in this world. But we do not lose hope. Because we know the day will come when Christ returns and makes all things new. We look forward, as we said just a few minutes ago in the, in the Nicene Creed, we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So in the midst of this sinful, broken world, we do not lose hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. Forgiveness of sins, new life and salvation, they are ours in Jesus. And so we say, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. I love how it seemed so utterly hopeless for Jairus. And people are even telling him, just give up hope. You know, Jesus can't help you now. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? That's what they said. And what did Jesus say? Do not fear, only believe. And so we place our hope in the only one who can help. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, with peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.